and uh, maybe let's start with a small calibration so that we can adjust our presentation to your personal needs. So um, who is familiar with uh, vector search? Oh yeah, that's nice. And uh, who did training before on vector search to make it better? Ah, okay, yeah, some. It would be nice talking to you later, by the way. <laughs> that would be cool. Um, cool, then we can start right away. So <laughs> here's our buzzword slide. <laughs> Uh, including a buzzword we created, by the way. Uh, the, it, it should not be called like creator of neural search, but creator of the buzzword neural search, because uh, vector search existed before, I guess. And um, yeah, here you see uh, our open source uh, framework where you can um, build neural search applications with. And but we we won't talk about our products, of course, uh, but yeah, on the on the challenges we uh, we tackled uh, when working on this. Okay, photos taken. Yes. And um, I quickly guide you through uh, what we will do. Uh, first, give you an introduction of uh, what neural search is. Maybe have this part a bit shorter because all of you are familiar with this. Um, then um, also justify why we need uh, fine tuning or training at all, and then also fine tuning. Um, then uh, we give you uh, experiments uh, we did and also talk about the outcome and then explain the difference, what we think, like what the extension of neural search, so our password, what that means in contrast to traditional vector search and at the end of course the summary where you can uh, take photos again. So how does neural search work? Just for everyone who's not so much familiar with this, we have all these different uh, data types and uh, then if we have a network trained on these modalities, then uh, we can convert them into vectors. And once we have these vectors, so for instance, uh, like that's considered as example uh, for images, we convert all these images we have into a vector representation. And these vectors we interpret like uh, first value is a first dimension, second, uh, second dimension, and then we can arrange these uh, into latent space and our, our two-dimensional intuition would be like this coordinate system where we can um, give all of these images one coordinate. And then we come with a new image and do a nearest neighbor search and retrieve the nearest neighbor in that latent space. And that's uh, quite nice because we don't have to deal with all the complexity of the um, original data. We just have vectors. And of course, this can also be done cross-modality, where we um, have two networks which map to the same latent space, and then we can also run a text query and search in the image space, for instance. But this is just an example. Of course, we can also have all the other modalities and all kind of um, different searches from this modality A to uh, modality B. Mm, is that it? <laughs> like, once we have this and uh, then we're happy, uh, we, we can work on all use cases. No, but we, we cannot because there might be um, some very specific requirements to all these use cases. So as you can see in the first example, uh, based on this image, the perfect match would be something where the shape is matching of the clothes. So as you can see, it's like the exact same shape but a different color. And for another use case, it might be relevant to have the color matching, but the shape is not so important. So we need to train a different network for this. And for the last case, like uh, the clothes is not important at all, but just the type of person. Um, yeah, in the past, I was working on a model agency tool, and they just wanted to have similar actors, for instance. And then it should not consider the clothes at all. And in contrast, why do we need fine-tuning? Because actually we can train a network for all our use cases. Now this has um, some, some very specific reasons. For instance, we need less training data if we just do fine-tune. Otherwise, we would overfit if we uh, train full like neural network with a lot of parameters just from scratch. 
and then it's also faster we need uh, less resource training and uh, then also we can like it's maybe not too obvious for everyone we can make the hosting much more efficient um, because we just have this one big network uh, where we can retrieve our features and we host that efficiently and scalable on, on GPU. A lot of clients can use this at the same time. And uh, then what we actually train is like very small uh, multi-layer perceptron, or in this case, just a single layer, which does a mapping for that specific use case. And yeah, therefore, inference can be done much more efficiently. Cool, and now I hand over to our head of engineering. <laughs> Thanks. Can you hear me? Test, test. Is the microphone working? Yes? Uh, I don't think so. You don't think? Then I take this one. Cool. Uh, thanks a lot, Florian, for the nice introduction. Um, so now we want to talk about an experiment that you performed. And the idea was, uh, so we, in our company, we did some fine tuning. We have uh, built a lot of infrastructure to do neural search. And now we thought, okay, we want to test also our fine tuning, which was really something new we built on uh, Data set, and we had the problem. We didn't really found a good suitable data set that is uh, consists of dirty real world data. So we built this ourselves, uh, which is a little bit tricky. But anyhow, uh, somehow, uh, we took one which was pretty close to one of our clients, and uh, try to map somehow what is what is in real world e-commerce e what happens. And the idea is okay. The queries are pure text as you usually have, but the documents that you have are text and image. And we want to utilize not only the text data but also the image data. So our data looks like this. Um, we have articles like this nice shoe, and then we have article descriptions, which are con uh, contain some of the color, the material potentially, also certain details described. Um, and then we had several fields like name of the product and something like category, color, brand, and not too many fields. Um, this was somehow the articles look like. Um, on the right hand side, you see more. Uh, so Articles, so like images, some of what we had. And on the left hand side, you see uh, queries that we generated, like a light blue dress, blue jeans. Uh, so you, we included colors, categories, uh, brands, but also sometimes um, like limb fit trousers, so typos. Um, and yeah, then we uh, created, um, so this article fashion shop had 4,110 articles. Um, we took data from the WDC schema.org table corpus for public download which is provided by the University of Mannheim, and uh, yeah, used fashion and beauty articles. Um, for the evaluation, we created our own queries and uh, relevancy labels for, with it via Cupid. Uh, shout out to the OSC guys, really cool tool. If you do relevance uh, scores, use it, really cool thing. And then we, obviously, we are from Gina, so we fully utilize the Gina open source ecosystem for uh, solving our problem at hand. And what we did uh, try, we tried to combine Elasticsearch, uh, traditional Elasticsearch, uh, with vector search. This was our main target of the full experiment. OK, we want uh, Elasticsearch allows you to search traditionally quite well. Uh, people know this. And, but we want to use vector search additionally and not somehow as a replacement. And uh, another thing that we did, we only used in-shop training data. So we did, created no click data or any artificial other data for training, but just use them or what is inside the shop, which is the same that when you have an e-commerce shop, what else you have? You just have your data, your images, and that's all the data we have for training, uh, at least at the beginning. And so what we did not do, we did no, uh, not any da training data optimization. So we didn't do any tricks like, okay, what are the best fields to combine and so on, but just somehow just use more as our first approach. Uh, we also did no Elasticsearch query optimization, so no boosting factors and all these things, because first of all, we are no experts there. And second of all, um, we wanted to uh, see what we can do on top of the baseline of Elasticsearch and uh, yeah, see what we can reach there. And whatever we would have done, it might be just tweaking towards our evaluation data set, which we created, which would be cheating. So we said, okay, nothing happening there. And we also did no other Elasticsearch optimizations. So no custom analyzers. We just use the plain analyzers when you use Elasticsearch out of the box. And for uh, models, so when I talk about these three things now, when, when I talk about BM25, it always means uh, plain Elasticsearch search without so last, just a search backend. Um, when I talk about SBIRT, we use the MS Marco Distilled Base V3 model, and uh, which is a text encode, uh, embedding model. And when I talk about CLIP, uh, we use uh, uh, CLIP VIT Base Patch32 from OpenAI, which is uh, <laughs> actually not one model, but two models. One model which embeds text, and one model which embeds uh, images, but in the same latent space. 
And without further ado, let's directly jump to the numbers, and then afterwards I will explain what we did further. Uh, but first, let's go to the results. And here you see when there's a T behind the model, this means uh, we fine-tuned this, and when there's none, this is just a plain model out of the box. And what you see, uh, plain SBIRT performs uh, on our uh, data set somehow more or less similar as Elasticsearch. When we fine-tune it, also more or less similar, so I wouldn't say one is better or the other or worse, so they, the scores are pretty close. But what you see for CLIP here is, without fine-tuning, CLIP doesn't perform at all. It's just rubbish. But in the moment you fine-tune, you get a lot of uh, better results. And the reason is that uh, CLIP is trained on such a vast data set, and for example, for models, CLIP also know model color. It's like skin color of models, hairs of models, and looks at too many different things that are just irrelevant for our case. So here, the fine-tuning, we should really show the model, oh, these are the things you need to care of, like colors, shapes, whatever it is. Um, and so here, fine-tuning of CLIP, there is a huge difference. And then we wanted to combine them. So these are just the plain uh, models without a combination of scores. And then we want to combine the scores. And again, uh, the uh, Elasticsearch standard score somehow is unbounded, and we needed to do some normalization. And SBIRT and CLIP um, are cosine similarities, so they give us uh, scores between minus, minus one and one. And what we, we tried a lot of different combinations, and some of this worked best for us. Um, what you can see on the left-hand side, BM25 divided by BM25 plus 10 is more or less just a normalization of the score um, that you can do. And then we add the SBIRT score. Then these two together are somehow the text part of our score. And then we do two times the CLIP score. And the reason is that the text score and the image score somehow has the same weights in the final score, more or less. And when we did this, um, we got the following um, results. So when we adjust BM25, uh, BM25 plus SBIRT, we get a little bit better in the recall. When we then add CLIP, we actually get much better, even so that the CLIP itself was worse. The image signal somehow brought quite a lot of, uh, or quite some improvement. And when we also fine tune SBIRT, we get another bit of improvement. To be fair, there is quite a distance to the theoretical max that you can reach. So uh, if you can recall 20 articles, but only you only get 10, you obviously can't reach 1.0. So the theoretical max for the recall at 10 would be 0 0.7. And so there is quite some distance. But um, anyhow, there is quite an improvement uh, on top of the classic Elasticsearch um, um, search. And so again, a reminder, we did no training data optimization and no Elasticsearch query optimization. So there is. Uh, a lot of room to improvement, which we don't uh, tackle. So then we looked at the individual query. Someone checked, okay, where do we, what, which model works best? And no surprise here. I think this slide will be whatever what you expect. Somehow you will see here. So for BM25, um, in-domain vocabulary works really well. So whatever is in the descriptions, when you search for it, you will find it. No surprise. Um, it allows you, obviously, for manual uh, improvement. So you can do manual overwrite, which is much harder in when you ever train a uh, model. And when we do query expansion with the vocabulary that is in the shop, it profits a lot. And when you use the other, uh, the text model SBIRT, um, it works out of the box quite nice with synonyms, so that works really well. It also can work better than uh, BM25 with multiple typos. And when we do query expansion with uh, dictionaries, which have nothing to do with the shop data, but just regular expansions uh, from language dictionaries, then SBIRT profits a lot more from this expansion. And when we look, now look at CLIP, uh, CLIP profits a lot from visual features, um, like uh, colors. Uh, it can do colors that are not in the data set uh, quite well. Um, and actually, what we saw with doing the fine tuning, uh, you can have this knowledge transfer across articles. So when you fine tune a certain art, uh, someone have attributes, like the, uh, like a color for certain articles. But then you have multi color uh, other articles, which missing this one color, you can actually see uh, that this model picks it up and then can also retrieve other articles, which include the same color, but not in the text description. And one thing where the clip improved uh, or performed better than any of the other is, for example, light blue dress. These are the three top examples. You can argue the, in the middle one is not light blue, but there were only two light blue dresses in the data set. So uh, I think there's pretty uh, good results. And um, yeah. So whenever we had this very visual features, uh, clip worked really well. Fashion is obviously also a nice thing where you have a lot of visual features. So uh, that might not be as easy for, I don't know, technical parts, or perhaps even there. So how did we train our models? For SBIRT, we used, uh, also here is nothing surprising when you look at the uh, literature, somehow this is, I guess, what, uh, what is 
set to be the best thing to do. We tried a lot of different things, but this is somehow what worked at the end. So for training, we use permutations of attributes on the one hand side um, as uh, input, and then the document title and description on the other hand side. So it's permutations more or less fake the query, and then the document and title is what we have. And we use the triplet margin loss. If you don't know what it is, come to me afterwards. I can explain you, but I need to draw. And uh, we use two models, two separate models. So one for the queries and one for the product. And the reason is that queries have a completely different structure in how the text looks like than the products. So for queries, we have like these three word permutations or two word uh, permutations. Um, and the model needs a completely different way of un uh, understanding them than when you do, for example, the description you saw before, you have multiple sentences, so the model needs a different way of processing them. And that's why you, uh, we use the same base model, but trained to it, uh, somewhat copied it, and trained it individually twice. And yeah, as I said before, we use this base model, and we use our fine tuner client on, uh, that you can also use when you want to fine tune uh, for fine tuning. So to so explain again, what is this combination of uh, query and text? So uh, down here you see these combinations of Julia Jordan red dress. Julia Jordan is a brand. Red color and dress is the category. Or dress red floral is also the same dress. And somehow we use positive uh, training examples where we say, okay, these two queries should be embedded closely to this description. Or negatives where we say, okay, these two queries should be far away from these descriptions because this article obviously is wrong. And for clip, we more or less did the same, but not with the text, but with the images. So we also had training pairs and then, uh, or fine-tuned the clip, um, then, but the other one was not the description, but the images. No surprise here. So it's more or less the same as we had for expert, permutations of attributes, images of the item, triplet margin loss, also again, separate models because we have the text input and the image input, and um, yeah, use this model that I told you about before, and this is how we fine tune clip. So now in the abstract, I promise we use this on other data sets. And we actually have one other data set where we tried this and it also worked okay-ish. But um, we found it very hard to find good data sets. Because data sets that uh, somehow are used by in the research usually um, either they have image description, image description pairs or they just have descriptions and queries, but you seldom have everything together. And then we would have created another pair of set queries, which would be again fake like, or fake like here. So what we're actually looking for is a data set where we believe, okay, this is a real data set that we can show uh, our algorithm or our, uh, how we do it, things works. So if you have a data set and want to share this with us, we would be super happy if you go to nest.gino.ai and register there, and we would be happy to improve your results, search results, and see if our uh, approach also works for you. Um, ideally, data that is multimodal, where you have text and images, or text and audio if you have, rather audio or text and video is also fine. So D models is also fine, so we take whatever we can get, but somewhat it must always be the combination. And ideally, you know what good quality is for you. This is often also a hard part. Okay. Now I promise you, I go back to the buzzwords at the end, and um, this is very, per whatever I say now is very subjective, and it's just somehow how I see the world currently. This might change in three to six months again. Um, but for me, semantic search and neural search is more or less the same. It's just neural search. When we refounded our company two years ago, we wanted to have a new buzzword, and we created the neural search buzzword, and uh, but it means the same as semantic search. Um, but for vector search and neural search, from my perspective, uh, the, it shifted a little bit. So what I see, the common understanding of vector search is, uh, let's first recap some of what we did. When you need good quality, some of what uh, uh, we need, needed to do in our experiment, some of we needed to do a model selection, we needed to do fine tuning. After the fine tuning, we somehow needed to have an inference step, inference step where we um, use the same data preprocessing as during the fine tuning. Uh, Someone needed to do the same, the same uh, tooling as doing the fine tuning. Um, then we needed a database for indexing and searching, and we needed to combine the, uh, combine the scores. Potentially, a re-ranking step would be nice. Haven't done this yet. Uh, but when I look, at, uh, think about vector search, I believe these three are mostly tackled. So most vector search tooling cares about the, uh, indexing and searching. Potentially also about score combinations. Um, you can do this in Elastic via script scoring, for example. Um, it sometimes also cares about inference service. I think with Elastic, you can now use BERT models also to get your vectors, but for example, not clip models. So um, it, it's also part of the vector search tooling, but I am not seeing so much the fine tuning and some of the, uh, the things that you need in order to get the right models to really get something out of vector search. This is, from my perspective, not really part of the vector search tooling landscape. 
And so <laughs> to create this buzzword, so I think that the neural search shooting somehow gives you, uh, is, is all of this, if, if I should differentiate these two buzzwords. And um, so uh, I would like that we talk more about how can we actually get good models to get vector search running and uh, uh, get, get high, better quality, because this is something that's somehow a miss, which comes, I believe, because in semantic search and elastic search, um, writing your own um, lookup table or your own uh, inverted index somehow uh, was the first step and then it was really the challenge to scale this and to somehow uh, write these databases, scale them out and all of these things somehow were the uh, operational challenges and the engineering challenges and somehow this was mapped to vector search. That this was, uh, from my perspective, this at least my per personal uh, perspective, this was first solved in vector search before actually the quality was really solved. That vector search is effective. And now I believe we need to go back and say, no, no, first let's get the quality and then we can go further into the engineering tasks. Uh, or do both in parallel, ideally because we need, we'll need both. And uh, yeah, so as we said before, uh, we hope that we can add tooling for this. Open, uh, all our tooling is open source. And so I believe vector search is not versus neural search, but rather vector search is an integral part of neural search. So uh, quick summary. Um, I believe training and fine tuning whenever you do vector search and neural search is essential to get better quality. Um, combining uh, symbolic search with neural search is really powerful, and uh, when you want to do vector search, you should combine it, in my opinion. Um, then, from my perspective, vector search is an integral part of neural search, and uh, the genome source ecosystem provided uh, the tooling behind our experiment, so uh, whatever we did, somehow everything is open source um, and can be used by anyone. And if you want to test what our experiment on your data, then please contact us and we are happy to, to do this with you together. Thanks a lot. And I hope we have some time for questions now. And yeah, is, sorry for the small incident. Okay, now another incident. <laughs> <laughs> so. so with the Gina to Toolkit, suppose I'm a middle-sized e-commerce company. Uh, I already have a search function. I already have logs. Who do I need to hire to implement this well? Uh, can you, is this working? Is it now? Yes, perfect. Uh, so I would say an ML engineer, but for me an ML engineer is 20% ML, 80% engineer. So someone who can do a lot of engineering, uh, can do, do data processing, but knows somehow how to, uh, at least the concepts of machine learning. And so uh, ML engineer that's really focused on the engineering, I would say. So you do don't need someone who's experienced with search, who's seen the problems that you have with search and so on? Okay, so you don't have a search team at all. I mean, when you have already, no, I, 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 I already, have, I already have something working, but working badly. Okay, so I have, I have something built on top of one of the standard open source mm -hmm. engines. Um, okay, then this 9% this, uh, that I showed, this you can get without uh, Elasticsearch knowledge. Right. So we will give, uh, so we are currently, I mean, we did this experiment now and now building the, all the documentation, what we did, and that you can use it for your, uh, on your site uh, out of the box with your Elasticsearch. That's fantastic. Or, or OpenSearch, I hope. Hmm? Or OpenSearch, I hope. Uh, let's see where we go next. So currently we focus on Elasticsearch, but yeah. <laughs> so on. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, you were talking about fine-tuning, mm -hmm. and um, I was wondering, um, in the fine-tuning step, you mentioned that you do this kind of very shallow fine-tuning of only the last layer, right? Is that also what you did in the experiment? Uh, and do you have um, some evidence? Can you talk a little bit about how that compares with fine-tuning the, uh, the full uh, transformer model? Okay, so we did a lot of experiments over the past, uh, so, and uh, we showed in some uh, earlier experiments that somehow fine-tuning the last layer and clip works similar in similar quality, uh, and at least on uh, several problems that we had. For this concrete problem, we always fine-tuned the full clip, actually, and did not the last layer, but uh, now are in the process of, okay, can we uh, do this last layer to, or additional layer training and get uh, similar results again as in our other uh, cases that we had, because uh, this is just so much better for production. Because when we have, or when someone has multiple clients or multiple use cases, you just host clip the expensive one once on GPU, and then you can utilize with all the different services that you have. Thanks. Uh, I had a question regarding like how you 
blend uh, neural search and like no like normal standard search. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have not just like queries to 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 find your documents, but you have like filters. You have maybe like facet filters and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Like in that case, at least intuitively, it makes combi combination a bit harder. Like how how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think this is a problem of exactly. The database. So what we did, we did everything with script scoring because we have a small data set, so there's no point in using KNN and and combine afterwards, but we did all the combinations inside Elasticsearch directly via script scoring. And when you have all of what you just mentioned, you can do the same. But this doesn't really scale to bigger data sizes. So if you have 10 millions of data, this might be not efficient because the script scoring is just too slow, especially when you have big retrieval sets. So potentially what you want to do is, uh, yeah, then you come into first uh, retrieving and then filtering, or first filtering and then some more scoring uh, problems. Um, yeah, that's a good question. What do you do when you have big data sizes? Mm, okay. I think until uh, up to, I don't know, half a million uh, queries, depending on what is your latency re requests, uh, that might just work with uh, script scoring if you accept several milli uh, hundred milliseconds. But it, uh, yeah, yeah exactly. and I, I hope that the database is actually uh, at some uh, one of the next iterations come with a good combina way of combining them because, um, yeah, you can do it on our side, but uh, hopefully the databases do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, maybe something I could add. We have also partnership with Reviate, and uh, they are doing exactly this, like fully concentrating on the um, vector retrieval, also having filters applied, and yeah. So we, to some extent, also rely on their work that they make it good, and then we can um, have them into our ecosystem, basically. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Yes, not not a question, just a pitch. Sorry. <laughs> no. Um, so, so if anyone's interested in in Viviate, um, you can just come to me after the talk. So, um, as they, they already mentioned, Viviate integrates as a storage backend uh, with Gina, um, so with with Gina's Docker. So you can sort of move in the same space that you use Gina, for example, for for evaluation and for for training. And then if you say like, okay, I'm happy with this, I want to move this into production, and then at production, I want to serve it at scale, I want to add filters and these kind of things. Then uh, Viviate would be uh, one of the solutions. My, my preferred solution, but one of these solutions, um, to use that as a storage backend in production. Any more questions? So every, every, question, every question get a sticker now? <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, if not, then. Okay. Then no sticker. Then we have. Oh, you, but you have. Okay, you have. Um, yeah. So lovely. I'm glad that you guys shared the fine tuning benchmarks. I think that's a big missing piece uh, as a community. Um, but I, I think you touched on this too. Why did you see such a small lift when you were in the in the text fine tuning? compared to the clip fine tuning. I think you alluded to that. I just have no experience with the image fine tuning. What contributed to such a massive jump when you fine tune the image, uh, the image model in terms of recall and precision? You mean on the model itself that clip somewhere went from ten to forty percent? Exactly. I would say uh, why was clip before so bad? And the reason is because clip itself is trained on such a massive amount of um, visual concept that clip doesn't know what to concentrate on when you just show it our, some of our images. And uh, somehow with the, during the training, clip understood, oh, these are the things I need to concentrate and what I can forget about. And out of a sudden, it, uh, and it just may uh, it just somehow focus on the wrong parts of the image beforehand. And now it just okay. The the clothes are the important part, and the colors are important. And then I mean, we choose uh, with these fields. Uh, we choose category, color, and some more. But then also clip new. Okay, these are the, the fields that actually cares about. So hopefully, when we work with another data set where we have also perhaps richer fields that give, uh, then I'm really curious. Does our approach? works there or not. Perhaps it doesn't work because there are too many fields. Perhaps it works really well. I don't know. Uh, but I'm really curious to find out. Uh, there are some questions over there. If you can choose what you like. Um, so these are high voters or, or what is this? Just some chat, right? Mostly there are those questions. So regarding the offline setting, so yeah, we, we did everything in offline uh, somehow, uh, somehow. So we, questions from people who watch the stream now. Yes. Okay. Uh, 
I'm, I'm not exactly sure what I should get out of this question. So uh, obviously we did everything offline, so there was no, no online, and uh, we, we trained the model upfront once on the whole data set, and then we somehow did our ex evaluations, but we did no somehow uh, retrainings again and again. I think okay, so our next question is, um, you mentioned that you did not use any user data for training. So what did you use as a ground truth for similar or dissimilar when fine-tuning the expert model? Yeah, I think I mentioned this. So um, we used the combination of category, brand, and color, and other attributes in random permutations as the query, some, what is the query, and then the description as the, what is the article, and this was somehow our ground truth. But the same ground truth you could create when you, just, when you have a fashion shop with some tar, uh, somehow uh, tagged articles where you at least fill these uh, other fields. Okay. Um, oh, to be honest, I don't remember. We tried also several other models, but at some point figured out MS Marco works best for us and just stick with this. Um, and yeah, I think we didn't uh, use models that somehow uh, are more suitable for this symmetric, symmetric search. So where, where you have these uh, query doc documents pairs. And if we... I think the... the Fourth one I answered before, but let me answer again. So if you have different models, somehow you train them at the same time and always want that when you do the embedding on the queries and on the documents, they map into the same vector space. Somehow the embeddings that most models uh, create go into the same vector space and somehow for the same document is close together and for different documents are far apart. Okay. Yes. Of course, not just some words. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, I had a question regarding how you, if you did anything around picking a close negative during training. Uh, you mentioned briefly during this during the presentation about picking negatives. Mm -hmm. um, did you use any methods like mixed negative sampling, or did you? No, no. So we also have the methods for it, but we didn't use it here. Okay. Yep. Cool. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, thanks a lot for being with us. <laughs>